Father God. Come on, let's lift up God's name right now. Come on, open up your mouth and sing praises to him today. In Bible study, we learn about praising God in the temple. You are God's temple, and we are united here today to praise God. So open up your mouth and give him glory. Give him praise. Sing a new song to him today. Abba, Father, we worship you. We glorify you, Father God. Come on, push yourself today. And just say, God, I love you. If you don't know what to say, just say, I love you. I praise you. I worship you. I magnify you, God. We thank you for the breath, Father God, that you have given us another day to live, God. To open up our mouth and praise you, God. That we still live in a place, God, where we can worship you freely, Lord. Thank you, Father God.
Thank you, Father God. We worship you, Father God. You are the word in the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. Come on. What a beautiful name it is. Come on, tell them. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Come on, tell them. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. didn't want and done without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now come on what a wonderful name it is come on there it is what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Come on. I just want you to open up your mouth right now. We're about to declare who God is in this place today. And this may be a different routine for you, but sometimes we need to push through and open our mouth and tell God who he is. Because sometimes we need to remember who we are in God. So I just encourage you today to open up your mouth and sing with us right now. God, we just worship you. We magnify you. Are you ready? Death could not hold you, the bell tore before you, you silenced the bells of sin and grave. Come on, the heavens, the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, come on. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Come on, it's his kingdom. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. Come on, what a powerful, what a powerful name. 
Just, why don't we just take a moment uh, right here where we are and can you just lift your hands with me and can we just lift up the name of Jesus? The Bible says that if, if we will lift him up, he will do what? He'll draw all people to himself. And maybe you're here this morning and you just haven't felt it yet, but maybe, maybe you just need to say the name of Jesus. Maybe you just need to lift your hands and say, Lord, I love you this morning and and you'll, you'll feel his presence. Maybe you feel like you've been walking alone all by yourself all this week. And maybe you just have not had the best day. But can I just tell you that if you'll, if you'll recognize his presence, because the Bible says he is ever present. He hasn't gone anywhere. You just maybe need to acknowledge him. So can we just take a few seconds here? Can we just lift our hands? Father, we acknowledge your presence here today. We magnify your name and glorify you. And there is no other name at the mention of your name. Every disease and sickness and fear and phobia and problem must yield. Demons tremble at your name and cancer trembles at the name of Jesus. And leukemia travel just shatters and shudders at the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you glory. Jesus, we give you honor, for there's no other name in heaven besides yours. And we, your people, we magnify you. We, your people, glorify your name, Jesus. We thank you for your presence here. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So glad you're here. 
We want to we wanna thank Carla for filling in with us today. We've got a couple of team members who are out. Uh, she's going to be back with us next week. Sure, you shake people's hands and give them a hug and give them a tell them, man, you look good today. What did you do different? are going to come this morning and give us an opportunity to give our regular our regular tithes and offerings and I want to I want to thank you for your faithfulness and you know I was thinking about giving and thinking about honoring God with our tithes and with our offerings and I was reminded of the time when my office complex we did some trust meetings I don't know if you've ever been involved with some trust meetings of my department we took some people out and did a trust event and it's what happens is some people put on a blindfold and they walk you through a maze and you have to listen to the voice of the person that's guiding you there's other events where you you stood in a chair and they they lifted the chair up and it was just like do you trust your team members probably the hardest one for some people was they stood on a table and they had people behind them and you were supposed to cross your arms and you're supposed to just fall backwards into the arms of the people that were holding you how many of you know that requires trust right giving of your tithes and an offering you know what that is it's a trust it's trusting and believing that all the things that God says all the things that he promised us are true and the scripture says and a man meaning the finale of it I just want to tell you it doesn't matter how high of a table I have stood on and every time he's challenged me to take my giving to another level every time he's challenged me to take my offerings to another level every time I've pledged to a missions or an organization and I've climbed higher on the table can I tell you that every time I've taken that trust he's always delivered he's always met my need so this morning, I would encourage you, thank you for your faithfulness as you give your regular tithes and offerings. It is a sign of our trust in the Lord that we can live on the 90% better than we can live on the 100 without the blessings of God. And I'm just telling you, I have found it's better to live with His blessings than to cheat Him out of the other 10% because I have found that you don't want to rob God. Amen. So God bless you. Let's pray over our offerings. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you say in Malachi that we can put you to the test. We can trust you that you will open the windows of heaven and bless us. And we are a family of believers that have experienced the blessings of God on our life. 
God, we pray for the owners of businesses in this room today. God, that their businesses would be blessed, that you would bring income, that you would bring new clients and new people and new contracts to them. Lord, we pray for those of us that are employees who work for people like that. God, that because of our light and because of our productivity and the fact that we work as unto the Lord in whatever job that we have, God, that you would bless us and make us more productive so that we can be a blessing to our employer. And God, we thank you for the talents and the abilities you've given to us so that we can return back to you our weekly tithes and offerings. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you as you give. anything different today besides me do you notice the new carpet and do you notice the new front on our prayer altar space Didn't that look great come on it looks really really good so excited about that thank you guys for your for leading us today man we want to let you know that um, you know we were able to do this because of your faithfulness and your giving uh, we've not come back for one offering. We've not come back to meet our mortgage. We've not had to come back to meet our utilities. But we have money in the bank because of your faithfulness. And, and in, in two weeks, we're going we're gonna to talk about giving. And in two weeks, we're going to take a special presentation about missions. I've said to you all along that the only money I'm going to raise at this church is for missions. And so in two weeks, we're going to have a special missions presentation. And I want to be sharing that with you. I'm going to be asking you to consider making a gift. So if you need to sell a car, sell a house, if you need to get some stocks and bonds ready, uh, in two weeks we're going to have a special presentation about a special project that the Theistons of God is engaged in for the next two or three years. Where, and I've made a, I want to let you know I've made a $10,000 pledge for us as a church. And I just believe that we're going to be able to knock that out maybe in a week or two or maybe over a couple of weeks. But I just believe that, that God has blessed us. And, and I know you're a giving church, and I know that you love missions. And so I believe that God's going to bless us. Hey, it is good to be back. If I haven't met you or if you've been gone so long you forgot what I look like, um, my name is Mike. I'm the interim pastor here. I want to thank you for all the people that, that were here and filled in for a while I was gone. Can I tell you that they all said the same thing? Here's what they said. I don't know that I've ever met a nicer group of people. All of them said that. Every one of them. Even the one that's not even so friendly said that. Uh, you know, I mean, I've got one of our guests that you don't know. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. But they don't like to be hugged. And they said, you know, I was hugged so many times. And I said, well, welcome to our church. That's what we're all about, making you feel loved and welcomed. Uh, so thank you for being so kind and gracious. I, last week, I was at another church. Uh, because of a, an issue with one of our pastors and can I tell you I told the Wednesday night group that I was there Sunday morning I got there about 10 minutes before church started and all through church and after church not one person shook my hand not one so you're to be commended thank you for your faithfulness thank you for being such a friendly church uh, next week Following the service, we're going to have a parent meeting. Uh, Ashlyn, our new children's and youth in director intern, is just doing an amazing job. So if you're a parent, make sure you're here for that. On the 27th, we're going to be having serving communion, so make sure you're here for that as well. This week, we're starting a new four-week sermon series on the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm just excited to talk with you about the Holy Spirit because the Bible actually talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 800 times in the Bible. The first time that it's mentioned is in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. In the second verse of the Bible, it says this, Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Now, that word spirit in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word rock. 
rock. Now, you got to act like you got a, a kernel of corn, popcorn, back in the back of your, your throat when you say that because it's, it's like rock, <laughs> trying to get rid of it. But that word in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, it really means that it's like a wind or a breath, not just a normal breath, but a, but a violent exhalation, like whew, a, a rush of wind. In the New Testament, which was written in Koinonia Greek, that word spirit comes from the, Hebrew, from the Greek word pneuma, and pneuma means almost the very same thing, that it's like a current of air, it's a, a strong breeze or a, a blast of breath. Now, you need to know in the Old Testament, the Old Testament says that the Holy Spirit came and descended for a reason and for a season, but it didn't stay. So it would come and rest upon people for a period of time, and then the Holy Spirit would depart from them. But in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we see that not only did the Holy Spirit descend upon people, but the Bible says that he infilled them with the Holy Spirit, and he gave them the ability to speak in tongues. He gave them the ability to understand spiritual gifts. He gave them the ability to see supernatural things happen in their lives. And more importantly, the infilling of the Holy Spirit gave them the power to live a supernatural life in the natural world. That's important for us to understand. The Holy Spirit came to give us all of the power, all the blessings, all of the gifts, all these things, and we're going to talk about all of them. But he came so that you and I can live a supernatural life in the natural world. And in spite of that, says on the screen that it's just, you know, I think it's a tragedy that so many people end up living a spirit-less life. That they end a spirit-less life. Now, they know God and they're going to go to heaven, but they've really never experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit in their life. And I think, I, I think probably that is in part that maybe the Holy Spirit's gotten a bad rap over the years. I really think the Holy Spirit has gotten a bad rap it, because I know that when I talk with people that don't come from our faith persuasion, we're a Pentecostal fellowship, that they're actually somewhat scared of the Holy Spirit. Anybody know anybody like that? They're a little bit scared of the Holy Spirit, and, and maybe, maybe they've had, had some bad teaching, maybe it's some bad doctrine, maybe they've seen some stupid things on television, and maybe they've seen some stupid things in churches. Come on. But in this sermon series, can I tell you what you and I are going to discover is that the Holy Spirit is not weird. The Holy Spirit is not kooky. He's not flaky. He's not strange. In fact, the Holy Spirit is wonderful. The Holy Spirit is gentle. The Holy Spirit desires to be your best friend. And while some people and maybe some churches have put an overemphasis on the Holy Spirit, I think the greater problem that we see in America is that most people and most churches have put an underemphasis on the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So Jesus, on the day that he was betrayed, he's sitting with his disciples having dinner in what we would call the Lord's Supper. And at that event, he's talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. And he talks about the Holy Spirit. If you're turning in your Bibles, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, it's also on the screen. It says this, and I will ask the Father, and he's going to give you another counselor. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. And he says he's going to be with you for how long? Because what were they used to? They were used to the Old Testament model. What happened in the Old Testament? He would come for a season and for a reason, and then he would ascend. But he's going to come down, and he's going to be with you forever. He will be with you forever, and he is the spirit of truth. Now, what I love about this passage of Scripture, the next phrase, is that in the next verse, verse number 17, that Jesus himself describes the Holy Spirit five times. He describes the Holy Spirit five times. He does not describe him as a cosmic force. He does not describe him as a mist that kind of hovers in the corner. No, five times Jesus himself says the Holy Spirit is a person. Let's count them together. He says the world cannot accept him 
for they have never seen him, nor do they know him, but you know him, and for he lives in you and will be with you. The Bible describes, and Jesus, the Son of God, describes the third person of the Trinity as a person, not as a force, not as some aberration that kind of floats around, but as a person who has feelings, who has intellect, mind, will, and emotion, who can be loved, who can be hurt, and who can be rejected. In fact, That word counselor, when Jesus says he will be a counselor, that's another Greek word. And I know I'm giving you a lot of Hebrew and Greek today, but this is the word parakletos. So think like a parakeet. It's parakletos. And parakletos means that he's going to send a comforter. He's going to send an intercessor. Do you know that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for you? He's a praying individual. He intercedes. He works on your behalf. He's an advocate. He's a help. He's a comforter, and he wants to be your best friend. Now, who doesn't want that in their life? Who doesn't want an advocate? Who doesn't want a friend? Who doesn't want a helper to come alongside of us? I think one of the issues in life is that we think that if we had to choose between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, if we had to choose between Jesus walking with us every day in the flesh, being with us ever present 24 hours a day, or the Holy Spirit, can I tell you most of us, I think we would choose Jesus, right? I mean, that's what most of us would do. But you need to know that that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says in the same conversation that he had with his disciples on the the night of the Lord's Supper, on the very same evening in John chapter 16, verse number 7, it says this. Jesus says, it's actually better for you. It's actually best for you that I do what? That I go away. Because if, if I don't go away, then the parakletos, the comforter, The advocate, the intercessor, the the helper, your friend, your comforter, he will not come. And I promise you he will come because I'm going to the Father and I will send him to you. You see, in this sermon series, the main goal that I have is this. For us to learn that if the Holy Spirit has been sent here by Jesus, right? That's what this verse says. If the Holy Spirit has been sent here by Jesus... And he wants to be our helper, he wants to be our paraclete, he wants to be our intercessor, he wants to be our advocate. How do we learn to cooperate and walk with the Holy Spirit so that we can live supernatural lives in a very natural world? So in this sermon series, we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to be talking about the gift of healing and faith and prophecy and discernment. And you can think, well, why would we... Well, we believe all that. Uh, why, why, would, why would you be teaching us an Assemblies of God church, a full gospel-believing church, why would we spend this four weeks talking about the Holy Spirit? I mean, Mike, you're just preaching to the choir. We already believe this. Can I tell you that? I think I'm going to share some things that you may believe, but you may not understand. Some things that you may believe, but we're not practicing yet. Because it's been my experience in every church that I've ever worked at that there's a lot of people who believe in the Holy Spirit, but yet their prayer lives are flat. There's no victory in their life. There's no power in their life. There's no strength. Which really brings me to the question of the day it says on the screen is this. Why are so many believers living spiritless lives? Why are we living without the Holy Spirit? And and real quickly, I want to give you a couple of reasons. The first reason is this. I believe that one of the reasons why we live spiritless lives is because there are so many people that are actually unaware of the Holy Spirit. They're they're actually unaware of what the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit will do. In the book of Acts, which is the historical recording of the early church, if you read it, what I find fascinating is that from the very beginning of the book of Acts, the early church was founded and was opened with this outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the believers. Yet, fast forward 19 chapters. Fast forward about a decade and a half. 
You get to chapter 19 and you hear this story. It's chapter 19, uh, the book of Acts, verses 1 and 2. And it says this. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus. Ephesus is the modern day city in the country of Turkey today. And it says, and he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, we have no idea what you're talking about. No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, fast forward. A decade and a half before, everyone in the room was filled. It flowed over into the city. 20 years later, 15 years later, believers around the world don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. And can I tell you that I believe that's where we are today. So many believers, they love God. They're going to go to heaven, but they, they themselves personally have never experienced the fullness of the Spirit-filled life. Perhaps... That may be where you are today as well. You're saying, well, you know, Mike, I, I grew up in church and I've heard about the Holy Spirit, but I really never have personally experienced Him. You know what? Today, I want you to know that God has got a whole nother world available to you. You have an inheritance as a believer to walk in the Spirit and to experience a Spirit-filled life. But just a lot of people are unaware of the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you, there's a whole other world. Let me, let me illustrate it to you this way. I don't know if you've ever flown international. Anybody ever gone on an international trip around the world? I mean, I've been all over around the world, okay? There are really two types of travelers when you're traveling overseas and around the world. The first type of traveler are like me. You get on that big, huge jumbo jet, you walk in, and you take a hard right, and you go to the back of the plane. You know what I'm talking about? And you sit in these little bitty, teeny, tiny chairs. You're all scrunched up. When I flew to Israel, I was on the airplane for like 21 hours, all crunched up. And then there's another group of people, when they walk on the airplane, they don't go to the right. Guess where they go? They go to the left. And the only thing that separates the left from the right is this little bitty curtain. And that curtain is like the DMZ in North and South Korea. If you cross that line, the people on that side will tell you, you don't belong here. Go back with the peons in the back of the airplane. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we all know what I'm talking about. I just want to tell you, I have never bought a first-class ticket. I'm on the right. But about a year and a half ago, I was flying somewhere international, and I got bumped up to first class. And I just want to tell you something. There's a whole nother world on the first class side. They're actually nice on that side. On the left-hand side of the curtain, can I tell you, they call you sir and ma'am. On the right-hand side of the curtain, they tell you to sit down and shut up. On the left-hand side of the curtain, your chair is not stiff. It only, does, it only doesn't go back two degrees. In first class, can I tell you, that chair lays down, flat, like a bed. You can actually sleep in first class. It's an amazing experience. And listen, can I tell you something else different about first class? When you ask for a Coke Zero... You know what they do? They bring it to you in a real glass. Like glass glass. Not like on the right, where you get pretzels and a plastic cup. On, on the right, you get this little like one size fits all meal, but not on the left. On the left, you know what they do while they're waiting on the plane to take off? They bring you warmed nuts cashews and peanuts and almonds. Listen, I had never thought about warming nuts up. But I'm just telling you, it's, it's, it's a whole different world. Not only do you get warm nuts, but you get a three-course meal with real silverware and linen napkins. Come on, you know what I'm talking about here. 
I just want to tell you, not only do you get a place to sleep and you get a three-course meal, but they give you booties. You can take your shoes off. And they give you these warm, comfortable little sock things so that when you're laying down, your feet are warm, and they give you this really nice, cozy blanket. I just, I want to tell you, there's a whole nother world on that side of the curtain. And I want to tell you on that side of the curtain that there's a lot of Christians that I know that are living on this side of the curtain and there's a whole nother world that's available to them if they only were aware of it see on that side of the curtain they're struggling and there's no strength and there's no power they're not living a supernatural life in an ordinary world but you need to know that god says you have access to the other side of the curtain you have availability to go over there because God says, I've got more things for you than you are aware of on this side of the curtain. Can I tell you, I, I, don't, I, I, I never want to come in and take another right. I, I, I've tasted something different. Why would I want to live on the other side of the curtain? Because there are things in my life that human power cannot fix. I don't know about you, but I know that there are some of us that are going through some things that human power just can't fix. And Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, but you will receive power once the pneuma, once the rock of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I think we as believers ought to be people who say, Lord Jesus, I just want to live on that side of the curtain. I want to live where the power is because there's things in my life and I want your power in my life to fix the issues in my life that I humanly cannot fix by myself. The second reason why you and I need to have an experience with the Holy Spirit is this. One of the reasons why people don't experience it is because they resist the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know if you know what I mean by resist the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we feel what we would call prompting. We feel this urging. We, we resist this voice that we hear in our life. The Holy Spirit says to us, hey, I, I, I want you to do this. And we go, nah. Mm. Not sure. Not, not sure, so sure I want to do that. Or, with, or the Holy Spirit will say, listen, you've been blessed. So I want you to bless someone else. I want you to give something to someone else. And we go, ah, oh, I don't think so. I worked, I, worked hard, I worked hard for my money. And so we find ourselves resisting these urging, these promptings to, to follow the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life. And you, you need to know that when we inadvertently resist and push against the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our life, can I tell you what happens to our heart? Our heart begins to be hardened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Our heart becomes hardened to the promptings of, the God, of God. And it's really not a new thing that people resist the working of the Holy Spirit, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, you know the story of Stephen. Stephen was a leader in the church, and he's speaking to the Sanhedrin. And he's just, the Sanhedrin was a group of religious leaders of the day, and I'm telling you, after what Stephen said to these religious leaders of the day, you know what they did to him? They stoned him. They stoned him. But let, let's read the word, what he said in Acts chapter 7, verse number 51. He's talking to the religious leaders of the day. See how this fits. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Come on. Boy, that's, that's harsh language right there. Here's what also he says. This is not new. This is not new to this generation. He says, in fact, you are just like your who? Not your mother. You're just like your fathers. You always do what? You always resist the Holy Spirit. That's just like so many of us, I believe. We resist the voice of the Lord. We resist the promptings of God. And, and we begin to resist Him. And as a process of that resistance, our heart becomes hardened to the things of God. In fact, 
the saints of old, I mean, long, 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 long time ago, they would describe this hardening of the heart as a process. They would describe it as a triangle that was placed inside of your heart. And when the Holy Spirit begins to prompt you, when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you, if you begin to push back, if you begin to resist the promptings of the Holy Spirit, that triangle in your heart begins to spin. And the points of the triangle would begin to rub against your heart and you would feel the sting of conviction as it begins to turn inside of your heart. And because you're resisting the Holy Spirit, the more you resist Him, the more the triangle turns and it begins to prick your heart. But the more that you resist Him and the longer that you ignore His promptings, the more it spins. But here's the issue. The corners of the triangle begin to be rounded off. And eventually, the more you resist him, all that's happening in your life, you have this little circle because all the corners have been knocked off. And there comes a day where you don't even recognize the promptings of the Holy Spirit anymore. You're not, you don't sense the convicting power of the Holy Spirit anymore because nothing bothers you. It's easy to ignore God. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, man, I don't, I don't want that to happen in my life. Man, I, don't, I, I want my triangle to be intact. How about you? I, I want to be sensitive to that prick of the Holy Spirit in my life. Well, how do we know, and this is a question I get asked all the time, how do I know that it's actually not my thoughts, but it's actually the Holy Spirit working in my life and talking to me? Can I give you my rule of thumb? Here's three things that I, you, should, you could probably use these three. It says on the screen, number one, if it benefits me, right, come on. If it makes Mike Harper look good, if it makes me get a little polish and shine, if it's something I can Instagram about, come on, you know what I'm talking about? If it benefits me, guess who it's probably from? Me. But if I feel convicted, the triangle in my heart starts spinning and it's rubbing against my heart and I, I feel this conviction that I need to stop doing something or I need to go do something and it's convicting me, can I tell you that I always assume that that's the Holy Spirit? I always assume that. And if I feel this prompting that I'm supposed to give something away, that I'm supposed to bless someone with something, can I tell you that I always assume that's the Holy Spirit? Why? Why? Because I'm selfish. Anybody here besides me selfish? Come on. Yeah, three of us are honest. I'll see you guys in heaven. The rest of you, we're going to pray for your eternal salvation. Listen, I'm a selfish person. I work hard for my money. I'm not tempted just because you're holding up a sign that I'm going to give you money. I'm just not wired. I'm thinking, get a job, Bubba. Get a job. So in those moments when I feel like I'm supposed to give some of my hard-earned money away or a resource that I have, I just assume that it's the Holy Spirit. And you go, well, what if you miss it? What if I did? Then all I've done is bless somebody. That's the worst thing that can happen to me. Let me give you a real practical example of this promptings of the Holy Spirit. About, about three weeks ago, I had to have a physical for some tests that I'm going through. And so I go to my doctor, and, you know, you have to strip down and put on that little paper, little thing. You can't actually tie it like you're supposed to, but you're, you know what I'm talking about, that little gown thing? And so I, I'm, I'm getting pricked and prodded and all kinds of things, and while he's pricking and prodding me, I really feel this thump in my heart that I'm supposed to ask my doctor a personal question, that I'm supposed to ask him, Doc, how are you doing? Now, you need to know that the moment that I felt that prick, like maybe I'm supposed to ask him how he's doing, can I tell you, I started thinking, ah, that would be weird. I mean, that would be weird. I mean, all we ever talk about is shallow things, right? How about those cowboys? How about the weather? I mean, uh, I mean it wouldn't just be weird if I asked him, Doc, how are you doing? And, and so... The, the longer that he's pricking and prodding me and doing all the things that he's doing for this test, 
the more I feel like, man, you're supposed to ask him how he's doing. And I start thinking, well, that's weird. And then I find myself pushing back, resisting the Holy Spirit urgings in my life. And finally, I just said, hey, Doc, can I ask you a question? I said, I really feel like I'm supposed to ask you, how are you doing yourself? And can I tell you, his head snapped at me, and his mouth dropped, and he looked like a deer in a headlight. And in about three seconds later, he dropped all of his professionalism, and big old tears began to well up in his eyes. And he said, how did you no. He said, Mike, actually he called me pastor. Pastor. Two hours ago, I found out that I have an 18-year-old daughter that I never, ever knew that I had. Two hours ago. And all I can think about is two things. How do I deal with the emotions of an estranged daughter? And number two, how in the world am I ever going to tell my wife about an 18-year-old daughter that I never knew that I had? We prayed together, and I gave him some words that I felt like the Lord gave me. But can I tell you, that wasn't Mike Harper. I'm, I'm not that intuitive. Can I tell you what that was? That was the prompting and the urging of the Holy Spirit. It was not a product of my intuition. It was the product of a powerful God who advises and guides us and wants us to live a spirit-filled life. And I'm just so thankful that that time I, I did not resist the nudgings of the Holy Spirit. I tell you that story not to talk about the times that I've won. Listen, I can tell you hundreds of times that I've resisted. But here's what I do know, that God has more for you and I than we are aware of on this side of the curtain. That God desires for us to walk and live and breathe in a spirit-filled world where he can use us to do his work. Maybe for some of you, God's been prompting you to stop doing some things that you're doing and you go, I, no, I don't want to stop doing that. Maybe for others of you, he's been nudging you to do some things that you've never done before and you're thinking, ah, I just don't know, that feels so weird, it feels so uncomfortable, I'm not so sure I want to do that. But can I tell you the danger of resisting the nudge Resisting the, pro the, the prodding, it's this. If I was always reaching over to grab my wife's hand and to hold her hand, whether I'm driving down the road or whether we're walking down the street or we're walking in the grocery store, and every time I reached over to grab her hand, she pushed my hand away, every time, Every time, every time, day after day, week after week after week. How many of you know that there would come a day? Come on. There would come a day when I would stop trying to push myself on my wife by holding her hand. And the Holy Spirit is just like that. He's just like that. When you resist him, when he's speaking to you, when he's trying to prod you, when you resist him, the Bible uses this phrase, that you are quenching the spirit. And what does quenching the spirit mean? It's actually, it's actually a word picture, and it's the word picture of someone that's got a roaring fire, and you come along with a huge bucket of water. Can I be honest with us? That may be a reason why some of us do not live the spirit-filled life that God wants us to is because we have continually poured the bucket of cold water on the promptings and the proddings of the Holy Spirit. Because in your personal life, or because in your married life, or in your public life, or your business life, you have resisted 
and resisted and resisted and resisted the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And now he just doesn't even come and talk with you anymore. Because you have said, I just want to live on this side of the world. I want to live on this side of the world. When in reality, God has a life for you. It's beyond your wildest imagination. A spirit-filled, a spirit-led, a spirit-empowered life. As I close, real quickly, three things that the Holy Spirit wants to do for you if you're taking notes, number one. If you're going to live on this side of the world, number one, the Holy Spirit wants to comfort you. He's called the comforter. He wants to be there for you when you are hurting. It says in John chapter 14, verse number 6, I pray the Father and he will send you another comforter. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he will abide with you, not just for a little while, but forever. Seven months ago, right before I came here, I was sitting on the platform at a big event that we hold. My phone rang, I had it on silence, my phone rang, and it was my dad. Ten seconds later, I didn't answer it, ten seconds later the phone rang, and it was my brother. I stepped out, and my brother said, Dad thinks Mom's dead. My son was in the meeting, I, I said, I did like this, Connor, I said, come like this. And so Connor came with me. We jumped in my Chevy pickup truck, and we headed toward Cleburne where my mom and dad lived. And I remember praying with my son and my brother, who was still on the phone, on my drive back toward Cleburne. I found out that my truck has a governor at 98 miles an hour. I did everything I can to break that governor. I've not done it yet. I'm going to fix it. But I found out on that drive home that it took me, it was about a 45-minute drive. It took me 33 minutes to get there. I remember rounding the corner, turning into the street that my mom and dad live in, and I see the fire trucks, the EMT, the police cars. And can I tell you, I hadn't cried up to that point in time, but the moment I saw that, I just, I just broke down into tears. And, and what I remember, there's a lot that I don't remember, but what I do remember is this sense of comfort by the Holy Spirit. Like he wrapped this supernatural blanket around me that was warm. It was his presence. It was his comfort. It was his peace. And, and it was as if he was saying to me, it's going to be okay, Mike. It's going to be okay. Can I tell you? Whatever you're going through, can I tell you, you need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Number two, he wants to counsel you. He's the great counselor. When you don't know what to do, he wants to be your guide. He wants to give you directions. On the very same night as the Lord's Supper, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse number 13, but he said, the spirit of what? Truth will do what? He'll come. And he will guide you into all truth. Listen, when you don't know what to do about your health, when you don't know what to do about your business, when you don't know what to do about your marriage and your family, what you can do is lean in on this side of the curtain and say, God, I need you to send the Holy Spirit's power into my life to help guide me through this circumstance. And it will be just as real as this illustration. A number of years ago, I've been a decade and a half now, I, I was asked to, to fill in at a Christian television show my, my pastor was hosting it, and he got sick, and they just needed somebody to come in and fill it in for him, and, and so uh, they asked me to fill in. So I got there right as it's about to start. I walk on the studio set, and a producer sticks something in my ear. Now, this is 15 years ago. He sticks something in my ear that today you and I would call earbuds, right? So the interview starts, and all of a sudden, I hear this man's voice in my ear. And he's saying, hey, Mike, sit up taller. You're slouching. It's like, he says, in a minute, cameras are going to roll. I want you to look straight ahead in that camera and tell everybody your name. And I looked at this camera. He goes, no, not that camera, the other camera. He said, camera number three. And I looked at, there it was. He says, just follow the lights. 
He says, three, two, one. A red light opens on camera number three, and I go, hi, my name is Mike. I'm filling in for Pastor John Kilpatrick today. Today we're going to be interviewing so-and-so. In my ear, he's saying, now, Mike, get ready to ask a question, but look at camera number four to your left when you ask the question. So I look at camera number four, the light flashes on, and I ask my question. This happens for 25 minutes, over and over and over. Sit up straight. Talk slower. Do you have another accent? That's what he actually said to me one time. Do you have another accent beside Texan? That's what he said to me. Truth, true story, in my ear. He's guiding me. He's talking me through the interview process. At the end of 25 seconds, he says, okay, Mike, you've done a great job. Now look in camera three, the one straight in front of you, and smile and tell everyone, thanks for watching in times like these. Light comes on. I said, thank you for watching in times like these. He says, five, four, three, two, one, and the camera went off. The whole time, I had someone speaking into my ear, telling me what was going to happen next. Telling me what to expect, what I can experience. How could he do that? Because he had the program right there in front of him, and he had the whole thing planned out. What does that sound like? Sounds like the Holy Spirit to me. Listen, there are times that I've had the Holy Spirit in my ear, but can I tell you that the Holy Spirit just hasn't been in my ear. He's been in my marriage. He's been in my business. He's been in my finances. He's been with my family. Why do I want him talking to me about all these things? Because he is the spirit of what? Truth. And he will guide you into all the things that you will allow him to guide you in. I love this verse. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 21. Where the, whether you turn to the right or to the left, you're going to hear the Holy Spirit behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. The last thing the Holy Spirit wants to do for you is to convict you. In fact, I really believe that as I've been speaking today, the Holy Spirit has, been begun, has begun to convict you. He's been talking to you. I think he's been talking to you about things that he doesn't want you to do anymore. I think he's been talking to you about some things that he does want you to do. And more importantly, I think he's talked with you about some things that I've not even mentioned. Things that I have not even hinted about. But inside your heart, you're feeling the Holy Spirit talk with you and says, I want you to do this. I want you to stop doing this. Who is doing that? It's not me. It's probably not you. It's probably the Holy Spirit. That's who's doing this. And one of the ways that you can delineate between the Holy Spirit and conviction and the, ho- and the devil and condemnation, because those are two different things. There's a big difference between condemnation, which comes from the devil, and conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, the devil desires to condemn you, and the condemnation says, you're a loser. You've always been a loser. Your mama was a loser, your dad's a loser, your, your whole family's going to be a loser, and it doesn't matter how hard you try to break it, you'll always be a loser. That's what the devil says. That's not what conviction says. See, conviction, can I tell you? When I wrote this in my notes, I thought no one's going to believe this. Can I tell you conviction is wonderful? Conviction is wonderful. You see, conviction says... God the Father says, I know exactly where you are. I know exactly what you're going through. Would you give me your hand? And would you let me guide you? Would would you let me pull you out of where you are from this world into a better place that I have for you? And if you will allow me, I'll lead you. And I will take you from where you are to where I know you can be. And I will will lead you to a better place. I I don't know what you're going through today, and as I close, maybe in your life,
Maybe in your life, you, you just need some comfort. Maybe you're going through some loss and going through some experiences that you just feel like some things have been ripped from you. You don't understand it. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit wants to be that comforter. He wants to come alongside of you and help you, number two. He wants to give you guidance. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. And maybe you've just been ignoring it, and maybe you think, well, he only wants to talk to me about these things. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about all things. That's what he wants to talk with you about. Maybe you need to know that the Holy Spirit is convicting you right now. Maybe you have felt that little triangle in your heart, the edges clicking against your heart, and you're going, ah, that, that prick of conviction in my life is God saying, don't go that way. Come this way. Jesus says, I know you don't want me to go away. In fact, the disciple says, let's build a monument right here. Let's just build a monument right here, and you, you, we're just going to stay here because Jesus is here. But Jesus says, it's actually better for you. It's actually better for us that I go away so I can send the comforter to come. I don't know where you are in your experience with the Holy Spirit, but can I tell you, really only two sides. The side over here where you try to make it on your own and you're on your own and you're going to die and you're going to go to heaven but you're not going to live a, a, a life that's full of victory and joy and contentment or you can penetrate the veil and say God what I want in my life is I want to live a spirit led life I want to live a spirit filled life and I want to live a spirit empowered life that's why the Holy Spirit came. Let's head every head bowed and every eye closed. And you would go, Mike, I've been to church a long time, but I, I kind of get what you're talking about for this conviction thing. And maybe, maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Mike, I, I, I'm feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit in some areas of my life. If that's you, would you join with me and lift my hand? I got my hand lifted. Say, Mike, there's just some things in my life that the Holy Spirit's convicted me of right now. Yeah, I see that hand. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? There's just some things in my life. Yeah. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, Mike? I, 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 I've never really experienced the Holy Spirit. I've allowed some bad theology or some bad experiences to keep me from being open to the Holy Spirit. And I would say I'm on the right side of the plane. I, I've never really experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life. If that's you, you say, you know what? I would like to go to a new level in my experience with the Holy Spirit. If that's you, would you lift your hand and say, that's me? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we stand? And can we just, can we just take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us right here? Can, can you just take a moment and say, Holy Spirit, I, I want to yield to this conviction that I'm feeling in my life. I, I want to yield to these things, and I don't want to resist you anymore. Can you just right now make this moment where you're standing a holy altar? Lord, we just ask. God, for those of us that, that sense that convicting power of the Holy Spirit in our life, Lord, we ask that you would help us to be people who say yes, who yield to the prompting, who yield to the prodding of the Holy Spirit so that we can have this intact relationship with you, that when you speak, as it says in John, that we, your people, know your voice. God, for those of us that are, that are needing guidance, we ask for guidance in our life. God, I ask for the churches that I work with, the people that I work with, that in those moments that, that you would fill my heart and my mind with words and that I would be spirit prompted by you to follow the promptings in my life. And I pray that we as a church would be a group of people that say, we just don't want to speak in tongues on Sunday morning or Sunday night and Wednesday night or in our Bible studies or in our personal prayer time. We just don't want to be closet Pentecostals or Sunday morning Pentecostals. But God, would we be full of your spirit 
that we would be a church that would walk in the Spirit, be Spirit-filled 24 hours a day, Spirit-led 24 hours a day, and Spirit-empowered. In your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. As I was thinking about how to close this service, I just really felt like I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to say this. If you want to live on this side of the curtain, say it and expect it. Just expect it. Can I tell you today, I, 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 can, just, I can just start moving when we're driving. I can just start moving my hand toward my wife. You know what she does? She reaches over and grabs it. Why? Because she's responding. And I'm saying to you, if you'll say, I want to be on this side. If when he starts feeling that prompt, if you will respond, you'll feel more of these prompts. And you will find yourself walking in a whole nother world than what you experienced in the past. Amen. Let me bless you. Father, I bless this congregation. I bless these men and women of faith. I bless this historic church. God, I believe that, that our best days are ahead of us. God, I believe that our future is bright. I believe and I speak prophetically that our house will be full. Our people will be full. Our children will be full. Our youth ministries will be full. That men and women are going to be saved. God, I just prophetically speak that over us. We pray the prayer of faith and we declare that we cannot do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to move on our church. We bless this congregation and we ask that your favor would shine upon them in your name I pray and everybody said amen. God bless you. Don't miss next week. Going to be talking about the power of the Holy Spirit next week.